what is the matter with you people? <laughs> this is a talk on reincarnation. Why are you here? Re reincarnation is silly. Right? I know some of you had to come here because your professors made you, but most of you are here voluntarily. Well, you're afraid to sit in the front. Um, reincarnation is not, right? I mean, you all know what reincarnation is. I mean, it's the notion that you come back uh, after you die to another life and you continue to do this over and over again, right? Really? You guys want to hear about that? So let me give a quick um, uh, apology. I've, I've been watching the Kavanaugh uh, Ford hearings all morning. I am an attorney. I teach constitutional law here. I've been following the court my whole life, and this is a really important day. This is a real teachable moment at those at those hearings. And so, if I seem incoherent on this talk today, it's because I haven't prepared. And that's what a lot of my students will tell me before they give a talk in class. Right? Um, but I've also had the privilege of writing a, a, a brief to the United States Supreme Court, so I've devoted my life to the law. And so this is a really interesting thing that's happening today. Uh, hopefully you'll pay attention to it if you haven't already. And look at all the different subjects that it covers. Law, history, political science, sociology, psychology. I mean, the whole nation's getting another one of these really cool teachable moments. Regardless of what side you're on, this will be a real momentous day for the court. So, reincarnation. Uh, the idea has been around a long time, right? Uh, ancient religions believe it. Uh, we're still talking about it here today, obviously, right? Look at this. And is it possible that there's a kernel of truth to it? I mean, let's face it, it does seem silly, does it? Oh, come on in. Oh, darn, I was hoping she was going to sit up front. So reincarnation will just do... Uh, uh, a little kind of uh, academic exercise here. It's a Latin word, and it, be, it literally means entering the flesh again. That, that's kind of what this hearing at the Supreme Court's about today, isn't it? But that's another topic. Um, I promise you I wouldn't be myself, but I sometimes can't help it even though I'm on camera. Um, it's, it's this idea that one soul does not end up just having one life. Now there might be some of you in the audience who don't even believe that we have one soul, right? Atheists don't. Lots of people don't even believe in this soul idea, right? You're a body, uh, you know, we evolve from rocks, fish, apes, and then we die and that's it. I won't be talking to those of you who believe that because that wouldn't be very fun, right? There wouldn't be anything to talk about. Then there are people um, who believe in these things very devoutly. Most of your Eastern religions have for a long time, even before Christianity and even before Judaism. So why? Did someone uh, sitting around the fire in the middle of the night, um, you know, on peyote, come up with this cool idea that maybe we come back after death? And then they were so charismatic that they got everyone in the world to believe it for a while. Is there any kernel of truth to this? So, so let's play with it. Um, the ancient Greeks believed it. We have our new uh, professor of philosophy here. He's, I think we have Stoic Week. Is that next week or two weeks? It's next week. Stoic Week next week. And so, so he knows, I hope, that the uh, ancient Greeks believed in reincarnation, Pythagoras, Plato, Socrates, others. Um, Hindus, Buddhists, Sikhs, they all believe in reincarnation. And all those religions preceded Christianity by hundreds, if, if maybe thousands of years. So it's been around a long time. Now some of the Eastern religions have this concept of karma in it. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, maybe what we understood about karma isn't quite right. In 2009, Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life ran a poll, and they're one of the better pollsters around. They run polls on uh, societal notions and cultural ideas all the time. 2009 was really the latest solid uh, poll that I could find. 25% of Americans in 2009 believe in reincarnation. That's quite a few. 25% of Christians. 
Now, if you're a Bible-believing Christian, you're not allowed to believe in reincarnation. Why? Well, it's an interpretation from the Bible, primarily out of Paul. But what if I told you that the earliest Christians did believe in reincarnation? We have solid evidence of that now. They say, what? What? So how can some Christians, and in fact today, Unity Church, for instance, believes in reincarnation. Some aspects of Judaism, uh, the, the more mystical ones, the Kabbalists, etc., believe in reincarnation. Now, these folks are all reading the same Bible, right? How can we get to such a different conclusion? And I talked last year about who, who wrote the New Testament, and there you find that the story is very complicated. <laughs> and that's how, why it's easy to get different, different interpretations, even though we're reading the same books. So my argument to you today, and, and apparently you agree with it since you're here, is that you really shouldn't believe in anything unless you've really researched it, and you should not believe in anything unless you've really researched it, right? I mean, that's the essence of having an open mind. So let's play around with this. Let's start with uh, faith. So we all know the Christian story. I'm assuming most of you here are Christian or at least uh, have that in your background. And so the story of Jesus seems to kind of obviously support reincarnation, right? With his death, ascension, and return to earth. Some disagreement on whether it was an earthly body or not. Um, but that whole notion that there is a soul, that it survives death, and then it can return to earth in some fashion, that very story seems to be supportive of reincarnation. Traditional Christianity says there's one soul, one judgment, and just one life. Now, in a minute, now this is not, if, if you're not a religious person, don't worry, don't <coughs> run away. I'm going to talk a little bit about religion, and then we'll focus on the science piece of this. Did, did I say science? We're going to talk about how science looks at reincarnation? Yeah, I think you'll find it interesting. But... Christians believe in the one soul, one life, one judgment idea, and it flows mostly out of Paul, the writings of Paul. Paul never met Jesus. Paul never heard him speak. In fact, Paul brags that he never got any of his knowledge from the disciples. In fact, Paul is the first Christian who channeled. Please. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. You can ask questions. If I don't like the question, I'll just move on, kind of like this hearing that we're watching this morning. And if I think it's a good question, then I'll, then I'll honor it. But, but if you, something's really bugging you, please interrupt me. Um, and so how could the early Christians, right? We know that there were Gnostics, uh, and, and uh, their records were destroyed, declared, you know, heretical, outlawed, all the way up to the 6th century. So 600 years after the death of Christ, you have folks fighting about what this all means. And so in the 6th century, there was a group of, of, of bishops that ruled that uh, Christians could no longer believe in Christianity. Um, prior to that, Theodosius, who's the emperor of Rome, in the 4th century ruled that the Gnostics were heretics, ordered all their books to be burned, and ordered them, anybody who believed in the Gnostic beliefs to be killed. This is probably not the best way to figure this out, is it? <laughs> I mean, imagine today how much less divisive our politics would be if one side just had the right to say, we're right, we're going to burn all the social media and books on the other side, and you talk about it, we'll kill you. Things would settle down. A generation or two from now, we'd all get along. We'd all believe the same thing, and it wouldn't matter whether it was true or false. But obviously, it's okay to debate this. That's what we're here today, right? I am very unlikely to be killed after giving this talk. Right? I feel safe. Now, we didn't find out much about the Gnostics until some discoveries in the 1940s. 
uh, in some clay jars in Egypt it's called the Nagamandi scripts or the Gnostic Gospels, some people call them. And there were dozens of ancient religious Christian texts that were found that we had heard about but had never had in our hands. Um, and we heard about them primarily because traditional Christian leaders had attacked them. Theodosius, of course, ruled them all, the illegal and ordered them to be burned. Um, many of the early church fathers wrote, and, you know, because these teachings were scandalous. So maybe you've heard of some of these books that were discovered, the Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Mary, Secret Book of John, my favorite, which is the Acts of Paul and Thecla. Um, but there's dozens of these texts. You can now buy them, buy books with them. You can now read about them, and you can get a sense of what a whole different group of Christians thought. Now, they had some really radical ideas, very different than what traditional Christians teach today. And this isn't a talk on Gnostics, but I think it's important to have a sense that there's not one way to interpret the good book, because the early, many of the earliest Christians think completely different than Christians do today. So they believed in reincarnation, but they also believed that there was two gods. I really like this idea. They argued that there was the God that had created earth and evil and hunger and pain. We know about that God. We live that every day, right? Here on earth. But they argued there was a second God. And that second God was a God of love and peace. And that's the one that had birthed Jesus and sent him on his mission, his ministry. Arguably, we're still arguing about that today. <laughs> right? This, the Christianity split right down the middle. We've got denominations that are hell and brimstone and fire and judgment and anger, uh, right and wrong. And we have religions that are real heavy on love and forgiveness, uh, non judgment, etc. This split continues, right? But it's interesting. So then you say, and then also, the Gnostics rejected most of Paul. The very first Bible ever fashioned was in the second century. And it excluded about half of Paul. And it's because they thought it was forgeries. Now these are people who are very close in time to that. Less than a century after Paul's death, there were people arguing, leaders, Christian leaders, arguing that many of his writings are forgeries. And today, about 80 to 90 percent of scholars believe about half of what Paul has written in the Bible is not him. Whoa. Maybe you can have me back and we'll talk about that one next year. But I could get killed, though, for talking about Paul in this way. <laughs> that would be different than a reincarnation talk. So that should grab your attention. Whoa, you mean there's a different way of looking at this? I mean, all the books in the Bible are, 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 aren't disputed? Wow, that should grab you. So, if the Bible is said to reject reincarnation, how can early Christians believe in it? How, how can it be? Because it's an interpretation. The one soul, the one life, the one judgment is not an obvious interpretation from the text. Okay. Now, I think the best book on this, and I'll try to give you some books for those of you who want to pursue this, and obviously you can email me, michael.davis at yc.edu. But the best book on this, I believe, is called Reincarnation, the Missing Link in Christianity. It's by Elizabeth Clare Prophet. And she, and it's a, it's a big, fat book, and it goes line by line through the Bible and the Gnostics and uh, Jewish teachings and the whole bit. It makes a very strong argument, in my, in my opinion, that reincarnation is consistent with the Bible, consistent with Christianity. Check it out for yourself if you're interested. I'm going to give you a couple of quotes here, and then we'll get to the science. The science is, is fascinating. Old Testament. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, this is important. The Gnostics rejected the Old Testament. The earliest Christians did not think it was worthwhile to read the Old Testament. Again, they believed in that new God that had sent Jesus, and so they were only interested in the teachings from Jesus and his disciples. That's very interesting. And imagine how different our theological discussions would be today if Christians did not honor the Old Testament. Again, it would be night and day. 
So having said that, I'm going to start with a quote from the Old Testament. <laughs> before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. That's Jeremiah 1, uh, 5. Hmm. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Okay. What did Jesus say? <coughs> say uh, does the... Uh, New Testament offer any clues? I think it does. I think these couple of things I'm going to read to you are really, really very fascinating. So Matthew 16, verses 13 to 14, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? His disciples replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Elijah is a famous uh, Jewish patriarch. And still others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So Jesus asks, what that, what, what's everybody out in town saying? And the first thing they say is that he is the reincarnation of some famous folks. What does he say? Does he go, that's crazy, guys. Well, there's no such thing as reincarnation. Why are you talking like this? No, he doesn't. In another passage, Jesus seems to accept the reincarnation for himself. Matthew 17, verses 10 to 13, the disciples asked him, Why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus re replied, To be sure Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished, in the same way the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. Pretty clear that Jesus' own mouth is saying that Elijah is reincarnated in John the Baptist. And that John the Baptist is satisfying Jewish prophecy that required that Elijah must come first. Pretty strong. Pretty strong. And again, there's no record of them saying, what? What are you talking about? They seem to be discussing reincarnation with Jesus as if it's commonplace, as if it's believed by many. In fact, many Jewish groups do believe even to this day. Final example, John 9, verses 1 through 3. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. That's key. He saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So neither this man nor his parents sinned. So Jesus isn't saying, what do you mean, how could he have sinned? He was born blind. The, the implication here is Jesus is saying, in his prior life, he hadn't sinned, but that something else is going on here. Their question would only have made sense if this person had sinned in a prior life. Otherwise, it would be a nonsensical passage. And again, we never get any follow-up from the disciples. There's no record anywhere in the New Testament, excuse me, in the Gospels, of one of them saying, well, wait a minute. You're talking about reincarnation here. Explain that to me. They're having a conversation about reincarnation as if it's commonplace. Well accepted. So, Christians debated these issues for a long time. You have some of the Christian fathers like Oregon and uh, Clement. And, of course, the Gnostics argued for, for uh, reincarnation. And this continues for centuries. And so, finally, there's a council... I believe it's in the 6th century uh, where the Catholic Church rules that belief in reincarnation is a heresy and outlaws it. You can no longer speak of it. Again, not the best way to resolve a dispute, right? That in the Middle Ages you'll find out that many theological disputes are resolved with the sword like that. So, we can debate it today, and isn't it interesting that that prior survey shows 25% of Christians believe in reincarnation. I bet that's higher now, right? That's almost a decade ago when that survey was done. I'm guessing it would be higher today. All right. The 
if you're an atheist or a scientist, now you can wake up. Now we'll start talking the science. Now we'll, when we're done with religion, quotes from scripture. But the point of going through that is, in my humble opinion, it is okay for a free-thinking Christian to believe in reincarnation, that there is support within the words of the Bible. Now, obviously, you can also find some support for the one life, one judgment in the Bible, primarily in Paul. But after you hear this talk, if you're a Bible person, go back and read those passages. They're not at all clear. They are an interpretation. And that's true of most theological disputes. The only reason to have a dispute is because we can't really resolve it completely, right? That's why disputes have a life of their own. When things can't be easily solved or resolved, we argue. Science. Really? I'm going to talk science and talk on reincarnation? Science deals with facts. Observable, measurable criteria, right? Uh, my good friend uh, Steve Doyle teaches meteorology here, and he thinks all this stuff is silly. And my response to him is, he can't even predict the weather. <laughs> Why are we going to pay attention to his opinion on this? Right? <laughs> so if you are a scientist, or if you're here at college and, and you've been uh, tricked into thinking that there are such things as fact and truth, and, and, and you really uh, you know, want to learn about the physical world, I have bad news for you. There's no evidence it exists. The world that you think you live in, the world that you're functioning in today, where you heard about this talk, you made a decision to come attend. You're in a physical body sitting in a chair. It's Thursday. What if it's all made up? And ladies and gentlemen, there's much evidence that the world that you and I live in and function in is a mental construct, a cultural construct created by collective consciousness for which there's no proof. That sounds nuttier than reincarnation, doesn't it? But the debate over reincarnation is because we've got one group on one side that says, I believe in objective truth, the physical world, facts. And then the side over here that you know, believes this mumbo jumbo about how you return after life and you can come here in a different body, live a different existence. Really? Those seem to be very far apart. And so most scientists and most scientific people think reincarnation is silly. They also think God is silly, right? But that's because they're using a false comparison. They're arguing the mystical versus fact, when in fact they should be arguing there are mystical beliefs with this set of mystical beliefs. Let me give you some evidence that you ain't really here. So first, let's start with the fact that there's a lot of kind of anecdotal evidence for reincarnation. Kids that play the piano at age three, you know, play Chopin. And we call those child prodigies, right? Really? They're just that much better than the rest of us? How about people who are certain that they have been places or done things, usually in childhood they have these memories, for which they, you know, their parents know they've never been there, they've never done that, they don't know anything about it, and yet when you investigate it, oh, their stories are factual. These are very interesting phenomena. People who claim to have met people before in prior lives know their name, know their habits. They're six years old and they've never left home. There's a lot of data out there. Is that proof? No. Is that science? No, not at all. But it's interesting. That's why you're here. How about all the unexplained phenomena in the world? ESP, ghosts, mediums, psychics, mystics, 
contact from the dead, people who've returned after near death. What about all that? Is that just nonsense? Hallucination? I mean, you see this stuff in the popular press all the time. And most scientists just poo-poo it. Oh, it was a lack of uh, blood to the brain for a few minutes. And so they hallucinated chatting with Jesus and his, under this bright light. And it's just a coincidence that everybody who has a near-death experience seems to have that same experience. Oops. So we all made this up? So we all know our perceptions flawed, right? You've seen optical illusions. How about this one that's going around now? Let me get the name right. Yanni and Laurel. Have you have you heard that one? No. Yeah. So there's a recording on the internet, and and uh, so it's the same exact recording. Some people hear Yanni, and the person sitting next to you listening to it on YouTube is going to hear Laurel. Really weird. And it's a, if my memory's right, it's like a. Uh, pretty close to a 50-50 split. Does anybody remember what the split is on? I don't, I think most, I don't think there's a most. I think there's a, a split. You remember the dress? What color was the dress? White and, and blue or gold and blue? Remember the dress? Any of you have family members that's all different colors? I, I did. My wife's in the back. I think you hear... And I'm here, Yanni. And it is Yanni, by the way. We'll talk about that afterwards. So how, how can that be, right? That's just weird. Okay. How about this fact? This one should bum you out. We know that there's a light spectrum in the universe, and we know that we see, you and me, see less than 1% of all available light. We don't see x-ray, we don't see gamma rays. We don't see all sorts of frequency of light. One percent. Think about that. Measurable fact is based on a one percent view? That doesn't sound like science to me. Now let's talk about one of my most favorite topics of all, quantum physics. Anybody know anything about quantum physics here? if you do, don't ask any questions. <laughs> so I can get through I'm just kidding. You don't ask any questions, Andy. Um, quantum physics, the weirdest stuff on the planet. If you're not familiar with this, please, I beg you. I give talks to legal groups right now, and I beg them to read up on quantum physics. And they look at me like I'm nuts. You can imagine the legal profession listening to someone like me come in. Why would I bother with quantum physics? Because quantum physics has a profoundly different understanding of the reality we think we live in. It's so different that it doesn't make sense. I'm going to give you some examples. But here's the problem. It is the most successful scientific theory of all time. There is not a single proposition of quantum physics that has ever been tested and found false. You can't say that about Einstein. You certainly can't say that about Newton. The most successful, and it's the theory behind your cell phones, your internet, quantum computers are coming, lasers, etc., etc., etc. So the set of scientific understanding which basically says the physical world that you and I live in does not exist the way we feel it, see it, experience it, that's the most successful scientific theory of all. So when my good friends argue science, I laugh, I get such a good laugh. Because quantum physics says three-dimensional observable science doesn't exist. And it's been proven. That's the spooky part of quantum physics. Let's look at some of it. Quantum physics says that all the particles in the universe, electrons, protons, blah, 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 all the particles that make up this and me and the chair can either be fixed or can be a wave. But never the same at the same time. 
Anybody know what causes them to either be fixed or wave? Observation. Who said that? Observation. What? So what makes that chair take on a solid form is because you look at it. Don't look at that chair again. What are you doing? You look at the chair. Stop it. <laughs> now that's nuts. That's nuts. That's proven science. That's Nobel Prize winning science. Quantum physics also says, it did in the 1920s and 30s, that these particles that make up these objects that we think are really here can also be in two places at once. That's not like science, does it? 2012, Nobel Prize in Physics went to some scientists who were able to trick electrons into not being seen. They, they didn't realize they were being watched. And they found out they were in two places at once. 2012 Nobel Prize in Physics. This is not Deepak Chopra on PBS with Oprah. <laughs> this is the 2012 Nobel Prize in Physics. So you have, and also the observer effect. You have a well-known double slit. Go on the uh, uh, YouTube, the double slit experiment. There's animations. There's a tremendous amount of data on it. And so we know now that electrons are either fixed or a wave when they're looked at. What? That's why you'll hear crazy new age people say we create our own reality. You cannot find a serious researcher out there that will tell you physical reality exists outside of your mind. I dare you to go find him. And if you do, he'll be lonely. As I said, he, because the female scientists are smarter than this. Imagine there's no proof for a physical reality outside of your mind. A leading expert in this, Hoffman, University of California, leading expert in perception. This whole world we function in is a mental construct. So, this world we live in, it's a, it's a, a three-dimensional box, right? Up, down, depth, some people throw in time. So maybe we have four dimensions of this world that we live in. Here's some bad news for you scientists out there. There ain't no time. That's Einstein. That's one of your buddies. <laughs> Einstein said that time does not exist. And in fact, we've proven that time slows down. I just watched the show on this last night. Time slows down when it's at sea level. Time goes faster when it's at the top of a mountain. Einstein argued that time stops at the speed of light. I'm not sure if we've proven that one yet. We'll get around to it. This new Hadron Collider can move particles almost at the speed of light, so we might be able to test that theory. Brand new theory. I love this when this happens. Just last night I had to alter this talk because there's a new theory. Let me find it. New theory out of uh, Sydney, University of Sydney, called the Block Universe Theory. And it argues that we live in this box of reality where the past, the present, and the future all exist at the same time. Now again, this is researchers, peer-reviewed, published research from the University of Sydney. This isn't some crazy down at the, you know, Wiccan bookstore. Where do you laugh at? I know you've been there. <laughs> now, before his death, Stephen Hawking, this is a book I really recommend you to read. I think he gets a lot of things wrong in there, but on science, he's very good. He, Hawking gets things wrong when he steps out of science, becomes a philosopher. But he, in the, it's a book called The Grand Design, and there he said, look, there's only one way to take all this crazy quantum physics. Things in two places at once. Things, reality being altered when you look at it, which means you can't do observable, measurable science. Oops. The act of measurement alters reality. 
Einstein, I'm not Einstein, Hawking said the only way to make that work is he promoted what's called M theory. It's a type of string theory. And it says there's 11 dimensions. 11 dimensions. He's not the first to argue that. So we've got the three that we know about. Time's floating around. And that means there's another seven right beside us. We can't see. We can't touch. We can't measure. It's one of the leading scientific minds of the century. Now maybe, and some people who promote string theory have argued, this might be why we have phenomena like ghosts and ESP and mediums and this crazy stuff, is that they, unlike most of us, are able to interact in those dimensions that are right beside us that we can't see or measure. Maybe. Whoa. What does this have to do with reincarnation? I'll get there in a minute. Don't rush me. But, <laughs> but what I'm trying to do is build a little bit. And obviously I only got an hour to convince you of something that there's a thousand books on. But I'm trying to get you to step out of your smug little reality that you live in that you think is true because it ain't. There's no scientific proof for the world you think you live in. Here's my favorite. I, I teach a class here called Law and Neuroscience. It starts in a couple weeks. You want to come see me? That's, that's a plug. And we talk about some of this crazy stuff and what's the effect of this on law. Because law says, hey, you decided to do it. You had the ability to do it. And you knew it was wrong. And so we get to punish you. That's a direct contradiction of all the science that we have. We could bring in 100 neuroscientists today and 99 of them would tell you, you don't have free will, sorry. You didn't decide to come here today. It wasn't that amazingly good picture of me on that little side. <laughs> no. What we'll caused you to come here is the operation of a, quote, unconscious operating system. Think of your computer. You know you have Windows, and you can see that, and you can manipulate that. But beneath Windows is code. And I don't know anything about code. Uh, can you give me a name of the code that's underneath Windows that I run at the back of? Like system software, the BIOS? Yeah, BIOS. Okay. I was hoping for something better, but we'll, we'll take that in. <laughs> and uh, you don't see that code, right? Most of us don't know anything about that code. Ed te teaches classes on that here. And so your best scientist trying to figure out how the brain works believes that we actually all function at the behest of an unconscious system that runs the show and we have no awareness of it. Really? This one will blow your mind again. This isn't a talk on quantum physics, so I'll stop here. We've already proven, proven, that you can have quantum effects in the future that alter the past. They've done experiments. They've altered them in the future. They've gone back and reviewed the tapes of them. And the future change is now on the tape that was done three months ago. Peer-reviewed science. And we don't understand it. I'm not telling you this is all figured out. It's pretty obvious it's not, right? Believe it or not, we have no idea what causes consciousness. I'll give you a quick definition of consciousness. Self-awareness. Whatever your name is. You know, I'm Mike. I like charm. When I get up in the morning, I don't have to start fresh. I'm Mike right out of bed. I don't have to start again to figure out who I am, what I like, what I remember, etc. We have no theory on how or why that can happen. None. When I say none, I mean none. It's not a dispute. There is no theory that says the way you and I think we think. That I just intended to pick that up. There's no theory that supports that. In fact, very solid science says that when you decide to move your hand, 
your brain has already decided seven to ten seconds before. You did. There's implications for the law there. I hope you see that. So I decide to shoot you, but if I had a brain scan on, a little hat, you know, or if I was in an fMRI machine, and they were scanning my brain, my brain made the decision to shoot you seven to ten seconds before I did it. So, if you came in here thinking reincarnation is nuts, guess what? The world you believe in, it's worse. What you believe in is really dumb. Me too. I'm not picking on you. <laughs> world we all believe in doesn't have any evidence. And there's much contrary evidence. So now, before I get to that, one last thing on consciousness. The prevailing theory on consciousness right now is called panpsychism. It's the notion that consciousness is in everything. Everything. Consciousness in this. In rocks. Inanimate objects. That the only reason it shows up in us is a level of vibration and a level of physical sophistication. And if you think that sounds nuts, that's some of the leading brain researchers in the world. Christoph Koch is the guy to read on this. Runs the uh, Allen Brain Institute in uh, Seattle. All right, reincarnation. Now that I've blown up your world, now that you realize you don't get to judge reincarnation because your little world is true. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the people who have studied reincarnation, studied it. The first cat to really do this on a scientific basis is Ian Stevenson. He's a psychiatrist and he was the head of psychiatry at the University of Virginia. He has dozens of books, peer-reviewed articles on this research. And his research continues on the day. I don't know if he's passed or not, but he's no longer actively teaching. He became interested in the stories of children all over the world who at very young ages remembered names, dates, places of events in their lives that they couldn't possibly have lived. So he began researching it. Does it make any sense? You know, can we track some of this down? We've got a kid in India who says I was uh, married in uh, Bulgaria uh, the town is blah, 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 and this kid's, you know, this is, much as his research took place before the internet, so these kids weren't able to go, you know, three or four year olds aren't that good at, you know, doing this kind of library research. So there's this little town in Bulgaria, said I had blonde hair, I was married to the mayor, he killed me, and it was a big hullabaloo in, in the city, and he had to leave town, and so Stevenson trots back to that town, starts looking at records. Oh my goodness, there's somebody by this name. Oh, we got a photo, she's blonde. Oh, here's the death report when she was murdered by her husband, the mayor. Ooh. <laughs> I, I hear mumbling. Uh, remember, Suzanne, I told you you'd be mumbling before I was done. <laughs> Suzanne came today saying, oh, this is silly reincarnation, but it's a chance to get out of work, so I'll come down. <laughs> <laughs> And so I promised that she'd be mumbling before we're over. I don't hear any mumbling yet, but I'm not done. A few more minutes. <laughs> then he started looking at birthmarks. I find this really interesting. He found at least 66% of the time, the prominent birthmark on these children that were telling these stories aligned with the sort of horrible thing they were talking about in the past life. Yeah, that's good. That's statistically significant. Six out of ten times, almost seven out of ten times, there's some correlation to the story being told and the type of injury or death suffered and the birthmark in this present life. One of my favorite scientists, one of the most leading scientists in the world, been, no, been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize three times runs a, a, a big uh, intellectual think tank. I can't think of the name, obviously, right now, but it's in Budapest. He wrote a book called The Immortal Mind, Science, and the Continuity of Consciousness Beyond the Brain. And he took this data from Stevenson and many others, and he makes the argument 
that consciousness does not end at death. Is that Erwin Lasnik? Yes, yes. Pretty neat guy. He's really taken up this cause of taking some of the wild stuff from a variety of areas of science, putting it together into a coherent theory, and what he comes up with is mind-boggling. You have two prominent theorists, Stuart Hameroff and Roger Penrose, who created a theory of consciousness called orchestrated objective reduction. They say consciousness lives inside of neurons rather than it's a function of connection between neurons. Most of you in the popular press will hear our brain work because it's got a trillion synapses and connections and cells. And... No, they said actually consciousness exists in the neutron in what they call or what is called the microtubule. Hotly contested theory, obviously. But they argue that since consciousness is quantum, and it lives at a quantum level within the neuron, that at death, that consciousness goes into the ethers, does not, quote unquote, cease to exist. How about near-death experiences? This, I'm sure you've heard about these. These are where people die, uh, or, or nearly die, go into terrible comas, and they come back and they have fantastic stories to tell. And what's interesting is they all seem to have the same stories, right? Oh yeah, bright light, saw a movie of my life, it felt so peaceful there, I didn't want to go back, they made me come back, made me mad. Some will say they say Jesus, even people who don't believe in Jesus will say, oh yeah, he showed up, had a little chat with me, said you got work to do, get back there. Sounds nuts, right? But when they start studying them, what they find is that there's this pattern. And you can read books on people who've taken the patterns that are found in these varieties of experiences. They all are similar. Oftentimes you have people who are clinically dead, clinically dead longer than they should have been able to survive. In other words, I think it's 15 minutes, someone help me. I think it's 15 minutes without oxygen to your brain is permanently damaged. You have people that have died, been declared dead, flatlined on the machines, no blood to their brain for 45, 50 minutes an hour while people are still trying to revive them. And they come back just fine. No brain damage. Does it make sense? But then the story they tell doesn't make sense. A lot of these people have incredible stories and they talk about things that are happening to them in the operating room that they couldn't have seen. In other words, there's a, a screen up and they describe what they saw. But they shouldn't have been able to see that. Have you, read, have you seen any of these stories? Where are they usually at? Up up the ceiling. Up in the corner. Yeah. All these people say, yeah, I'm, up, I'm floating up in the corner watching. And then we have records of where people are flatlined, in other words, no electrical activity in the brain, but they can tell you everything that everybody said after they come back. So they've got perception with a dead brain. You mumbling yet? <laughs> there is a group. I love this so much. His name is Dr. Jeffrey Long. He's an emergency room physician. He's seen many of these himself. He now has a foundation that records these and is trying to collect. They have thousands. And in his hospital, and he's trying to get other hospitals to put screens up in the corner so these people can't see when they go up there. I'm not making this up. So that skeptics can't say, oh, they put a camera up there before the surgery, or, they, or there was a mirror. I'm not making this up. He's installing brakes so that skeptics can go, oh my goodness. Right? Now the guy that started all this near-death stuff is Dr. Raymond Moody. Lots of books, the first one's Life After Life. There's a lot of famous first-person accounts. Here's one that's going around. Anybody heard of Ibn Alexander, mm -hmm. The Proof of Heaven? Yeah, he's become really famous. So he went into a coma, basically died, uh, flatlined. Um, he's a brain surgeon. He's a, he's a neurosurgeon, yes. And when he came out, he, he had a very funny story to tell, right? He knew everything that happened, everything that was said. He had the, the white light and the chat with the man, you know, the whole bit, just like everybody else. But what makes him different? 
What makes him different is that he was standing up here at podiums like this, giving speeches before his death, saying, this is all nonsense. And that all these things are hallucinations by people who had a lack of blood to their brain. He's not a skeptic anymore. Proof of heaven, cool book. Great TV series on it. If you like this kind of stuff and you want to see it put into a dramatic setting, it's a, it's a documentary called Project Afterlife. I don't remember what channel it's on, but you can grab it on um, YouTube, Hulu, whatever, whatever the different things are. And there they document actual cases of people who have died, really died, been declared dead, and then came back. And they all have these amazing encounters on the other side. But here's the most important thing about all these people. Their lives are changed. Right? When it's over, they didn't just have an hallucination. You and I have all had those. Especially those of you who went to college. Yeah. Well, we're not profoundly changed by a long night out, are we? You know, we have to take some hangover stuff to get to the morning. But we're not profoundly changed. Our view of life isn't altered. All these people have had their view of life altered. They're not wondering about their purpose anymore. They're not wondering about death anymore. They're not scared of death. Many of them become very religious. There's really an interesting set of facts around this. Next, hypnosis and regression analysis. This is where people are put under hypnosis and they start talking about being Queen of Sheba. Right? It's nutty stuff. The only problem is there are two researchers who, who really put this on the map. One's called Michael Newton, Dr. Newton, Journey of Souls, Case Studies of Life Between Lives. And about the same time, Dr. Brian Weiss, Many Lives, Many Masters, The True Story of a Prominent Psychiatrist, his young patient in the past life therapy that changed both their lives. They both have a dozen books since then, but they started having, pay and they didn't set out, they didn't create regression analysis. They were putting people under hypnosis as a way of therapy, but these people started just spontaneously spewing out past lives. And then when they began to do some research on it, they began to find some factual patterns. But the most interesting thing is that their clients were healed when they went back saw some of their prior lives, saw some of the reasons for what they were going through now, and had profound healing episodes. Really interesting data. There's a lot of psychics and mediums out there now. They're on TV. They've got best-selling books. They're telling you that we plan this life before we come. That we have a little chat with our soul family, we pick what body we're going to have, what we look like, who we're going to marry, what kind of screw-ups we're going to have. And we come down here and we learn, and they say, forget about karma, that's a misunderstanding. The Hindu and Buddhist religions have karma, and that's the sense that you're being punished for what you did in the past. The mystics now tell us, no, no punishment, just learning. Now, if this is true, imagine how profoundly this would affect our lives how profoundly this would affect the law. If what they're saying is true, Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh are soulmates, that they decided before they were born to go through this experience together. Whoa. Sounds nuts, doesn't it? So there's electrons being in two places at once. A great book, if you're into this, is uh, Robert Schwartz, Your Soul's Plan, Discovering the Real Meaning of Life. You plan before you were born. If this resonates with you, this idea that you actually planned this and met with your soul family and decided to come here and accepted the, uh, the uh, forgetfulness from, that they say happens when we come from the other side of the veil, this doesn't sound nuts to you. The book is called Your Soul's Plan. So where do we end up here? Something's going on. We don't know what. I'm not telling you there's proof for reincarnation today. There isn't. But there's no proof for you even being here today. So don't be smug. Be open-minded. <laughs> Wonder about this. That clock's two minutes slow. Don't get antsy. No student leaves my class early. <laughs>
true story now. There's some amazing stuff going right on here in your backyard. Some of the craziest researchers on this are at the University of Arizona. Anybody familiar with Dr. Gary Schwartz? Yeah, read his books. He's the former head of psychology at Yale. Psychiatrist, that means medical doctor from Harvard. Board certified in five areas of medicine, including surgery. And he's put out books called The God Experience, The Afterlife Experience. He has a documentary I urge you to buy. It's not expensive, it's two discs, it's really fascinating. It's called The Life After Death Project. So Dr. Gary Schwartz is doing all this work and he had a great buddy who's a famous producer of sci-fi who was an atheist. He said, you know, Gary, this is all kind of silly. And so they worked out a deal. This guy says, look, if I die and it's really true, there's life afterwards, I'll let you know. And they said, okay, great. And so they set up a scientific protocol so that they would know that it was really him. And they set it up so that it had to be coming through someone else who wasn't aware of their plan. So Gary Schwartz didn't get to wake up in the morning and say, oh, I don't remember this guy's name now, Jack. Anyway, oh, Jack talked to me last night. Oh, there's life after death. No. It had to be something physically tangible through another person. They have been able to document 100 contacts from this fellow who died. It's in, the, it's in the documentary, it's also in the book. The Life After Death Project. Really interesting. Let me read you a quote from a mystic. So some of you will think, you know, some of you are on the science side of this, some of you are on the traditional Christian side of this, so I'm going to cut right in the middle and get you some, give you something really wacky. Uh, I like to read the mystics. Don't judge me for that. I heard that. Paul. So there's one called Lee Carroll I really like right now. Here's his quote. Don't use your logic to try to comprehend the working of spirit. Reincarnation involves a unique angelic core that comes and goes from earth. Each time it picks up a human soul. So you might say that a human soul is unique to each human every time. Don't spin in confusion over these concepts. Instead, go inside and see that, see that you've been on the planet many times and accept that there's a system that's honored and respected, one that you agree to and are participating in. Feel the peace and love of God that's provided for such a grand thing so that you can continue to help the planet. Do you have to label it and put it in your own structural box to believe it? If so, that box will remain very empty. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming.